Studio Views, which is in our main gallery, actually has, uh, is open for another week uh, till March 18th, so next weekend. And uh, this is the closing weekend for the rest of the exhibitions, including uh, Ryan McGinnis' uh, collection views. Um, first, I'd like to welcome back Ryan to Cranbrook and thank him for his projects, uh, plural. We've, he's been um, pressed into a lot of service in the Detroit metro area. Um, he is also responsible for the, um, our installation that is part of Wayfinding, which is a temporary skate park in downtown on Farmer Street near Campus Martius. Um, so if you haven't, if you weren't able to check that out last summer, I understand it'll be running again uh, this summer, at least for the first part of the summer. Um, and that's a skate park uh, designed by Tony Hawk. So, and um, all done in collaboration with our friends at Library Street Collective. So I'd like to thank Anthony and JJ for um, all of their um, help and coordination and contributions uh, to making all of these connections possible. It's been great, thank you. We are also celebrating the publication of Ryan's new, newest book, which is called Hashtag Metadata, um, which has everything, I think, to do with the show upstairs. Um, I was able to contribute an essay to the catalog, so we're very pleased with that, and we were able to document what is essentially a site-specific installation upstairs. If you haven't had a chance to see Ryan's uh, show upstairs in the main gallery, definitely uh, you'll have some time after the lecture to do that. Um, it is very much like a site-specific installation with 35 new paintings and, of course, an assemblage combined in labyrinth in the middle. Um, so it feels very much like an experience. Um, so we're very pleased with that. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, in terms of institutional exhibition support, the Maxine and Stuart Frankel Foundation for all of their support of Cranbrook Art Museum public programs and exhibitions. And Lastly, do I have a lastly? We're gonna be doing a signing of the catalog, actually, which will take place um, on the um, far end of the balcony area. And the catalogs, um, we just got the advanced copies, so um, they're upstairs available for sale. And Ryan will be happy, he's smiling. <laughs> we'll get you some markers, <laughs> and you'll have a great time. Um, but um, this is a really great opportunity for Ryan to share with all of us um, aspects of his creative process. Um, Ryan is um, one of those artists um, who kind of falls perfectly into my wheelhouse. I'm trained as a designer, graphic designer, and then entered the world of curating. Uh, and uh, since Ryan shares that same kind of background as a designer, but then uh, crossed over into contemporary art, there are a lot of affinities in his practice and the tools and the methodologies um, that he uses, which is a part of what I write about in the book. Um, and I couldn't think of a better connection to have here at Cranbrook. Um, we were uh, speaking earlier, we're, Ryan's of course younger than me, but uh, we were, uh, uh, at the same time there was a lot of experimental graphic design happening here at Cranbrook when I was a student here, and that was also of interest to him, and so there was that natural connection, but um, for a lot of what happens here in terms of experimental graphic design, Ryan is, of course, somebody we could point to and say, well, here's somebody who's taking all of that knowledge and all of those skills and parlaying it into a whole new area of practice that is not the traditional um, area of practice for a designer, so we're very excited about that, so hopefully the students here will be inspired by that kind of um, uh, artistic practice and that kind of opportunity. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ryan McGinnis. Andrew wrote a great, insightful essay for the book, so I'm, I'm, I appreciate that a lot. It's um, one of the few essays I can actually point to um, and guide someone to if somebody really um, wants to understand where I'm coming from, he really kind of gets it. And so um, I'm really super psyched to have, to have that in the book. Um, as you um, filtered in, you may have heard music playing. I was playing um, playlists from my Spotify account. I listen to music all day in the studio and I make numerous playlists, playlists for painting and sketching and drawing and varnishing and packing art and cleaning and, and uh, stu um, songs for studio visits and uh, photo shoots, and if um, you'd like to listen to them more, they're all public. Um, 
but that's really an aside. Um, I'm going to be uh, sharing with you 10 talks, five minutes each, and I'm going to set a timer to help me uh, keep pace. And we're going to start right away with a party, or rather, 50 parties. 50 parties is a project that I did from uh, 2009 to 2010 where I hosted a different party with a different theme, a different concept every week in the studio. Um, there were 50 parties, 50 themes, 50 weeks in a row in the studio. There were no sponsors and there were no strangers and all my guests got one of these um, little membership cards. The idea came about, as, as most of my um, ideas for projects do, um, out of uh, frustration. I was uh, living in New York about for about 15 years by this time, and most of the parties in Manhattan um, usually had some kind of um, commercial agenda attached to it. They were usually celebrating like the launch of some, you know, bullshit designer vodka or something silly like that. And so that was the idea. To, the idea was to kind of strip away any kind of commercial agenda to parties and just have parties for the sake of parties, use party as a medium. Um, uh, these are some of the facts about the structure. You know, it's every Friday at nine. Um, again, every week was a different theme, a different concept, and those ranged from uh, paintball to wine tasting to summer camp, to Vogue ball, goth party, cougar hunt. Um, in some cases, we where we invited uh, like a subculture into the studio to host a party, we would have them bring their guests as well. Uh, let's see, there was a photo booth in the studio. These are some of the invitations. Every week there was a different invitation for each party. Technically, there were 51 parties. We did a practice party, party 00. These are all 50 invitations, and you can get an idea of the range and the themes and the different uh, uh, concepts that were being expressed through the uh, medium of party. Um, the first one was a white trash uh, barbecue. My studio is in an old uh, factory building. I'm on the top floor. I'm on the sixth floor, so I have access to the roof. A lot of times the party spilled over onto the roof. Um, I wanted to do a paintball party at the very beginning um, of the year because I thought it'd be great if we shot up the whole studio and had um, paint splatters all over the studio and left it that way for the entire year. But what I didn't know, I didn't know two things about paintball. One, it's really powerful, and, and you could get hurt. <laughs> And secondly, those little uh, balls of paint are filled with fish oil. And so um, the studio stank and everything was oily and slippery. <laughs> the shoot the freak idea came from this horrible game out in Coney Island. I don't know if it's still there or not, but between two buildings in an alley, you can buy a bucket of paintballs for like $5, and someone would run around the alley and, and, and dodge the, and, and, and try not to get hit. You could try to shoot the person, shoot the freak. Um, anyway, so I put the bar in the back of the studio, and you had to actually um, navigate through the, the field to, um, to get a drink if you wanted to drink and try not to get shot. Uh, we did a summer camp. People camped out actually on the roof of the studio. I thought it'd be great if I rented a bear costume and, and scared people in the middle of the night, but the only costume I could find was the silly kind of cartoon bear. <laughs> so we had a pool party. Um, we got uh, over 20 bags of styrofoam peanuts and filled a pool and then returned those peanuts on Monday. Um, <laughs> we did a lot of that, buying and returning for the different parties. Um, we did a luau party. We did uh, a goth party. We did a Vogue ball. Um, we did a cougar hunt where we invited a group. They actually host real cougar parties for cougars and cubs, like a kind of a dating service. And we invited them to come into the studio and host one of their parties. Uh, you can't do a series of parties without addressing sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So, so for three weeks in a row, we did you know each of those. This is the, uh, the drug party. Of course, with each of these parties, you can imagine there are a bunch of stories to tell. And... Um, at the end of these 10 talks, I can certainly access any of these slides and answer any questions. I hope you have a lot of questions so I can easily go back to any of these slides. We did an Oscar burlesque party. Sometimes the parties fell on something that was happening in culture, and this week it was the Oscars. And so we combined it with uh, burlesque shows. So we had burlesque performers performing, uh, doing performances based on some of the nominated uh, movies. We had uh, an Atari rave where you could play Atari 2600 that was enlarged, um, blown up on a projected on a screen. We did spring break um, with Jello wrestling, and we had um, frat gear, Alpha Sigma Sigma. We did a, 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 an autopsy, <laughs> which actually scared a lot of people. Some people came into this party, saw what was going on, turned around, and left. 
We did a fight club. Um, there are a number of actually different underground fight clubs in New York, and we, seen, we invited one of these clubs in and uh, hosted one of their fights for the night. Uh, Kenny Scharf was actually the host for a sunshine party. Uh, Kenny usually does these kind of dark cosmic cavern parties. I want to do the, do the exact opposite. Uh, we did a prom party. Um, okay, so that's my timer. Let me zip through the rest of these. The prom party, I wanted to invite a senior, so I had an 86-year-old friend, and I invited her. She's in the middle. She was my senior date. Uh, and uh, one of the last parties was a naked party where everyone got naked and we painted everybody. It was a black light party, so it was in the dark, but you were painting, you could glow, and it was exciting and fun. Uh, my friend Spencer Tunick actually hosted this party, and so he uh, usually takes groups of, uh, large groups of people and photographs them naked, so it was perfect for him. The next talk is about drawing, and drawing is um, really at the, at, at, uh, at the center of everything that I do. All of my work starts with drawing, so it's really important for me and has been important for me to figure out what is drawing. So I've come up with a definition for myself. It's rather succinct. Drawing is recorded gesture. Obviously, the op operative words here are recorded and gesture. And what does recorded mean? Well, it's kind of um, a, a proof in a permanent form of the gesture having been made. And that, that permanent form can be in a material or it can simply be in a, uh, in, in a memory. Um, permanent, of course, is problematic because nothing, nothing is forever, and you can actually have memories for a long time, so I in, even include in my definition uh, a, a recording in your memory. Gesture is a movement of part of the body to express an idea or a meaning, and this can be quite literally as an extension of your hand or um, you know, eye movement or um, you know, blowing your breath. And so as examples, you can make drawings you know, with your eyes and tracking eye movement. Uh, you can make drawings. You can make drawings with uh, light, of course. Um, you can blow bubbles, blow a dandelion. These are drawings. Uh, you know, with gesture, you can you can sign, and those gestures are recorded um, uh, in your mind, uh, in the viewer's mind. Uh, another example of drawing is recorded gesture. Shadow puppets, of course, we can consider, or I can consider these drawings. This is obvious Matisse uh, with, a, with, a, with a long stick. Um, uh, dance, you can you know, draw with dance or moving your body, of course. Um, and, and again, it's really, drawing is important to me because it's at the core of my practice. And, and while in theory I have a broad and generous definition of drawing in, in practice, it's actually very tight. And my drawing process includes coming up with a, a very rough initial sketch, going through a a sketch process to get what I call get to what I call like a, a solution or a final sketch. Taking that final sketch, bringing it into the computer, and making a technical um, drawing, which is essentially a, a vector file. In the end, my drawings are um, mathematical equations, and that's what a vector file is. Um, and all of that is to say that I can't sit down and make just a beautiful drawing. I have to go through this process to make. Uh, something beautiful to get to where I'm going. Uh, the final vector drawing then serves as one of the ingredients for all the paintings and sculptures and installations and other materializations of those equations um, that become my work. This is an example. This is what that looks like. Uh, ink on paper. I'm trying to find the underlying geometry. When I do, I can bring that into the um, computer and, again, make uh, a more technical, um, geometrically perfect drawing. These are spreads from a book I made that outlines a lot of the um, standards that I go through in making my work. These are some of the tools, and this section in particular uh, uh, pertains to drawing. These are the, the, the markers, and only the markers that I use in the studio. And th again, this is some of the sketch process. This is actually Romulus and Remus on the left, and then you can see how the vectors are built on, on the right. And again, all of those final vector drawings become the ingredients for, for example, uh, get collaged together through silkscreen process in a painting or in sculpture. This is mirror polished aluminum on the left and then acrylic on the right. And then I also uh, make things on the other end of the, uh, uh, let's call it price point spectrum, and, and so mass produced products like skateboards and t-shirts and, and soccer balls. 
So with digital drawings, of, of course, there's, there's no original, there's no quantifying what a digital drawing is, and, and size uh, doesn't matter, and, and you only have relative scale in the digital world. And um, again, all these drawings allow for multiple materializations. And again, this is kind of more directly what that process looks like. This is an example of me taking an ink, a final inked sketch, bringing it into the computer, tinting it back, using it as a template, and then making a more technical drawing on top. And these are a few additional concerns about a, a drawing. Um, what is the difference between writing and drawing? Can we consider writing a kind of drawing? Um, what difference does intent make in drawing? Uh, are drawings made only of shapes, or, or only, only in line, or can shapes be considered drawings? And um, what role does authorship play um, in relation to drawing? So for example, this is writing, handwriting, and in typesetting. Um, there's my timer, I'm gonna zip through this. Um, intention, uh, the, uh, and, and you know, putting a, a writing instrument on the, on the end of an elephant trunk or putting it in the hands of a chimpanzee, are, are these animals intending to make drawings? Um, the same could be asked of, of, of a child, and uh, what is the intention there? And even if you strapped a, a, um, a pencil to the end of a branch and let the wind make a drawing, is that a drawing? Does intention even matter? Um, the, uh, the clouds and the trees here don't necessarily intend to make those images. Um, what is the intent of these drawings? Uh, these uh, shapes by Matisse uh, are, are, are drawings of sorts. Uh, these are early paintings of mine where I was obsessed with making paintings of drawings and in particular questioning the authorship of the drawings because I was using drawings that I found in the public domain. Um, and uh, drawings that had no authors, that belonged to everybody. The next talk is on influences, my influences, starting with my mother. She was a very uh, creative person who made crafts all the time, and these are examples of some of the things she made. You can see, obviously, they're very simplified um, icons and, and symbols. So those are the kinds of things I grew, that I grew up, um, you know, that were around me. When I was in elementary school, I was fortunate enough to go to a school for gifted and talented kids where I studied art for one day a week. And from an early age, um, the study of art was instilled in me as a, as a, as a, as a discipline, and, was, and it was difficult. This was a, a test from grade school that I had to take on Marc Chagall. So that was a big influence going through that program. I also grew up playing soccer, and I played for my city. It was a travel team. And at the end of every match, we would trade patches um, from our city with the other team, and we would collect these uh, patches from all up and down the East Coast. And these patches were very uh, simplified picture planes, and the nature of um, patches, they, they don't allow for complicated like photographic images. So the images were very uh, simplified, and, and these little picture planes were actually, um, um, you know, they, they were traded and valued. And I grew up skateboarding, and so um, very influenced by skate graphics and the transformative power of these skate skateboard graphics. This was 17th Street Surf Shop. I loved this logo, th these two fish coming together to form an S at the same time just blew me away. <laughs> this is a spread from my junior high um, a yearbook. Uh, computers were a big influence. I was in the computer club and the art club at the same time. And about, the, about this time, junior high and into high school, I discovered this thing called Dada and the Dada movement. And that was a huge influence, this anti-art movement between the world wars. And Dada influenced, I had a high school band, influenced the graphics that I was making for the band. These are flyers and cassette covers and t-shirts. And I know nothing about music, but what I, lo what I loved about being in the, in the band was making the, the propaganda for the band. <laughs> that was my role. And these are photocopy experiments. I played with a photocopier um, running the paper through multiple times. I learned about this magazine. It had a subscription called Emigre when I was in high school. It was a, a design magazine. You can see some of these radical layouts, which were a huge influence on me. Um, the timer is set to a little snippet of Pixie's um, uh, song from, from this album, this first song on Doolittle. And while you know I love music and it's hugely influential, 
what was had more of an impact on me was this gr were, were the graphics, and I came to learn that this guy Vaughn Oliver was the guy responsible for the Pixies album covers and a lot of the 4AD on on that same record label, all of their um, uh, album covers. And so this is some of Vaughn Oliver's work, and you can see the 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 layers of information. So I just you know even now it's it's just so fresh and and. Um, inspiring to me. I found this book when I was in high school, New American Design, and it was the first time I understood that there was this, uh, there's, there's this name to what I like to do. Uh, it, was, it was called Graphic Design. This is work by April Griman, hugely influential on me, where she embraced this kind of low-res um, computer graphic aesthetic and fully exploited it in her work. That was super radical at the time. Um, Tom Bonaro, the way he juxtaposed these kind of disparate images together, um, was really exciting. Even the way that this book was laid out to me was was just like super, it's just super fresh. And then and the, the negative space and the way the blocks of type laid out on the page, I just couldn't get enough of this. And I and I discovered this book around this time too, Cranbrook Design, The New Discourse. And I was influenced by some of the uh, assignments going on at Cranbrook in the uh, graduate design program at the time, deconstructing um, uh, labels. There's a Heinz ketchup bottle that was deconstructed. And you can see a, t a Tide bottle at the bottom. And you know this guy's work. I knew of Andrew's work for the longest time on the right page. And still, th I mean, this work just really gets my juices flowing. I can't get enough of this. It's so exciting even to see it today. Um, so, I, you know, this was a huge influence on me. In fact, when I was at Carnegie Mellon for my senior thesis, I went to my professors and I said, I want to do what they're doing. I want to take their assignments. Of course, they let me because it was kind of a self-guided course. So I was doing their assignments as best, as best I could. Um, Wolfgang Weingart, huge influence. I waited 10 years for this book to come out. I remember there were rumors and rumors of this book, and it finally came out. Um, big influence on me. Neville Brody, I'm going to zip through these really quickly. Big influence, graphic designer, um, British graphic designer. He designed the, um, the Face magazine, as well as um, uh, numerous other things, including a lot of things in the music industry. But here you can see just bold black and white graphics that I just, I just can't get enough of. Look how he kind of distilled down the word style on the left side. Very, uh, still very kind of uh, authoritative um, in its, in its uh, bold black and white forms. Um, and even today, I'm still collecting as many books about logos and icons that I possibly, possibly can. This is, of course, just one example. And every time I travel, I'm, I'm photographing the street signs. And this is a, a segue into the next talk on Skateboarding. As I mentioned before, I grew up skateboarding, but I was never any good at skateboarding. What I loved, the same as being in a band, I was never good at you know, music. I don't know anything about music, but I loved the graphics. I loved painting um, you know, my decks and my friends' decks and silk screening t-shirts and just trying to figure out how graphics worked and why you know, some logos were cool and others weren't and the transformative power of having the right logo on what was otherwise just an ordinary t-shirt. So these are some of the, the boards that were being released around this time that I, I just couldn't get enough of. And I recognized from an early age that walking into a skate store and, and looking at essentially oil on wood panels, because at the time all the boards were silkscreen and oil paint, that experience is just like the experience of going into a museum and looking at oil on wood panels and you're making value judgments based on the, the, the aesthetics. These are early paintings of mine on skateboards. I was showing these in galleries at the end of the 90s. Again, this was at a time when I was obsessed with making paintings of um, drawings in the public domain. I was also making uh, these scar uh, cardboard skateboard ramps as sculptures. And I did a series of uh, grip tape paintings. These are, this is a colored grip tape on wood panel. These are about two foot square, and of course they reference minimalism and, and, and Ellsworth Kelly, but they're actually side views of ramps. They're different transitions. This is one of my first solo shows where I showed all this work that I was doing on skateboards. 
and I was the first artist to work with Supreme to make a collaboration, and I did this series of five boards that look like or parody um, paint chips or Pantone strips. And I still paint on skateboards and do a number of skateboard-related uh, projects. This also more recently is a series of 12 skateboards um, painted and laser cut, and they're bolted together in a cantilever off the wall. It's uh, called Rainbow McTwist, and I'll do some commercial skateboards. This is with a company called Alien Workshop. Um, the skateboard shape obviously relates to signs and signage, and it kind of comes full circle, especially with this project where I did a series of signs and had the Department of Transportation in New York City um, put these signs up around the city. And most recently with the Wayfinding Skate Park in downtown Detroit, um, where Library Street Collective brought me and Tony Hawk together. And when I first met uh, Tony Hawk, I had to remind him that we'd met before. And I sent him this shirt that he signed for me 30 years ago um, at a skate contest in Virginia Beach along with some other professional skateboarders. And here's what the park looks like in case you haven't seen it. Uh, the, the idea for me was that I'd, I hadn't been to Detroit before, but of course all I knew was Motor City, and I thought, well, that's perfect because I love making signs and, and um, signage along the uh, motorway. That makes a lot of sense, and it relates to what I'm doing and the shape of the signs and the skateboards. It all kind of came together. So that was my solution for um, the art component to the park, and this is some young skateboarder at the park. This is Tony Hawk. This is Tony Hawk. <laughs> Details of some of those signs. The next talk is called Studio Practice Makes Perfect. Everything I do in the studio and, and the way I live life for the most part is systems based. And um, for example, I've kind of quantified all of these uh, tools in the studio and made drawings of those tools and this is a painting of those studio tools. And starting about 1996, um, I decided to just start wearing uh, white shirts only uh, as, as a way to kind of get rid of the variable of having to choose uh, different color shirts to wear, different kinds of shirts to wear. Um, so I've been doing that and um, wearing white shirts in the studio. And this is actually a, sh a Trump Loy shirt that I produced with Agnes B a few years ago. It's made to look like one of the painted shirts uh, that I wear in the studio. All my sketchbooks are the same size. I've been using the composition notebook uh, size since uh, 1995, and I finally got tired of trying to find them in the store and buying them each time I needed a new one, so I just decided to make my own with the um, parity information on the front and back cover, because you usually have like a multiplication table or something like that, so I put my own information on the inside covers. Uh, I make every year a calendar to-do list pad. It's the same size and format. It's half of an eight and a half by 11 sheet folded vertically. It's 11 inches by four um, and a quarter inches wide. And so I can take those um, full sheets of paper and fold them and put them in the same box. And I have blank pads in my studio where I write additional notes that are also the same size. So again, this idea of everything having, uh, everything that doesn't have to do with the work properly is, is systematized. Um, into these different formats. Even the graph paper that I work on is 30 inches by 22 inches with two and a half inches border on all sides printed in a very specific um, gray grid. And I get 2,000 of these made each time. Um, I, I got wigs, uh, or I had wigs of my own hair made, um, again, as a way to kind of systematize uh, the hair and also kind of fetishize the residue from the studio. And that's what's happening with this piece here. The, the silk screen, the squeegees um, that I use in the studio, they, they wear out. You can actually sand them down and sharpen them up, but it's easier just to buy new ones. And with the old ones, what I do is turn them into these squeegee trophies. I did an exhibition in Madrid in this museum, La Casa Encendida, where we recreated the studio. The whole exhibition was called Studio Franchise. And in order to franchise the studio, I, I had to create all of these systems. And um, in parallel with this exhibition was uh, an exhibition uh, that was partially installed. Uh, and so you see a lot of the uh, shipping boxes and crates. And then there was a uh, another room 
there was a final exhibition. So there, it, it, the show, the entire show showed um, the entire course of, the, of practice and how a painting gets made from the studio to partially installed to a final installed exhibition. In order, and also with the exhibition, I made a studio manual, which I showed some pages of earlier. This is actually some more, some more spreads. The studio manual is uh, a parody of like um, an identity standards manual that a corporation might uh, put together to ensure that their identity um, adheres to certain standards. And so while it is a parody, a lot of the information um, is real, in, you know, including how to tell the story of the artist, the short version, and then the long version, how to communicate that and stay, quote unquote, on brand. Again, that's the, uh, how, to, how to make the drawings, how to, um, how to put the paintings together, including all the D-rings, specifying that all the D-rings on the back of the paintings should be 10 inches down, how to apply the signature, how to clean in the studio with the grain, against the wood grain, how to stomp down the trash. <laughs> and a human resources section about codes of conduct and sexual harassment. The next talk is about a body of work. I make it a lot of different bodies of work. This in particular is called the black holes. The black hole paintings are are um, built on these flourishes and fleur de -lis that kind of fold in on themselves. This is an example of a six foot diameter uh, black hole painting painted in fluorescent paint with fluorescent um, adhesive vinyl on the wall behind the painting and then photographed in black light. And that's what's going on here. This is a, another black hole painting. They, they came about because I was very interested in the forms and the symbols that represent wealth and fanciness. So I became obsessed with heraldry. And when you look at heraldry and crests, you see a lot of um, organic plant forms and you see a lot of uh, leaves and vines. And those eventually over the years have turned into um, ribbons and, and flourishes. So this was a, a, an early kind of a proto black hole. And this is also a uh, kind of pre-black hole painting. You kind of see what's starting to happen with the composition. Another idea with the black hole paintings is that they would eventually just become meaningless and they would be about nothing and purely decorative. My goal was to make the most, uh, the fanciest painting possible, um, even, even approaching a spiritual uh, experience. So here I am, I'm, tr I'm trying to figure it out. This is an early black hole painting. I'm working on black holes uh, on the roof of my studio here. I really liked this idea of paintings just being luxury goods and again, kind of being empty of all meaning. I was making some black whole uh, lithographs, and that's what's happening here. Black hole prints. Um, this is a recent black hole painting. Um, some of the black holes in the studio during parties. Again, I was interested in these black holes somehow being um, portals to a spiritual experience, but also premised on um, being luxury goods. This is uh, Deitch Projects in New York, the black holes under black light. This is Cincinnati Art Museum. And I started to hang the black holes, obviously, together in the same space um, and on the same wall, and then realized, well, that wall is just another picture plane. So the latest iteration of these black holes has been where they've all kind of come together within the same picture plane. And there's a version of this in the exhibition upstairs. This is um, where the black holes are now. The next talk is about an Instagram project that I did from 2012 to 2015. This is um, a few years after Instagram has been had been around, and all my friends were telling me you should be on Instagram, you should do something on Instagram, and I, I just can't seem to do anything casually, so it, it really stressed me out, and I had to 
had to figure out what's the, inst what's the concept, what am I going to do, what's the project, I have to address it in a very formal way. And at the time I was doing, I was making these button pieces and I thought, well, well, that's the solution. I'll just take the buttons, keep them as digital information, and just post a button or two every day. And that's what I did. I just posted these black and white simple buttons, one or two a day, for three years. There were over a thousand buttons, and I didn't tell anybody what they were building toward. And at the end of three years, there was this reveal, and each little button comprised one of the dots in a coarse halftone of me holding one of the wigs above my head, and the whole project, of course, is a self-portrait, and it was called I Am Instagram. And then the image was um, uh, materialized as a, a, a wall piece um, it, at Sotheby's. And this is a little video that basically tells you all of that, and I'm going to tell you that again. Welcome. Um, so we're in my studio here. So in, we're in my um, studio here Chinatown in Manhattan. In Chinatown. So for a few so months, for um, a few months, encouraging me and asking me, people were telling me, you gotta get on Instagram, you gotta, you gotta do the Instagram thing. Using it. So when I decided, okay, I want so to tackle Instagram. I decided, okay, I want to um, tackle as a Instagram platform and make work specific to as the platform. a digital platform and make work Here's specifically the body of work to that I've already been working on. It seems Instagram. Like Here's a body of work that I was already working on because I'm creating it digitally a good match. and it's a digital platform. It, it makes a lot of sense for the work to live in that way. I decided to create the kind of anti -Instagram I decided to create project. the kind of so, anti -Instagram. no photographs making no work photographs. That's specifically yeah. to that making work specifically that lives only to the medium in, it lives only uh, in this digital furthermore format. to kind of well use furthermore it as an to kind of use it as an opportunity these, these, these buttons that uh, to display so I've gone buttons, back though, and working kind on of so cold the text I went back and cold from years sketch of sketchbooks from about 20 years uh, all of these these little phrases these little, little notes these little notes in these circles in these, these circles these little phrases actually, these turn, little phrases into actually turn into Instagram posts the which look like these. Instagram posts and look like these So I've been making button pieces for a while. So I've been making button um, pieces quite for quite literally. A while. And, oh, you know what I should do? This would be a great time for me to tell you that I do not have many clothes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, yeah. As buttons and then pinning the buttons to canvases um, and then making kind of larger meta images. So these are some of the buttons. button pieces yeah, that, that I was making. From you know, the 50 idea is that away, from like 50 snaps feet and away, focus. snaps and focus. And then when focus. you get up, and when you really get up close, close, then you can read the, you can individual, read the individual buttons. The end is the, end the reveal of this larger halftone image. And the halftone image this is larger a, image. Um, it's a self-portrait, again, of me holding up a wig of my own hair, which is a reference to Warhol's fright wigs. But of course, it's not, it's not artificial hair. It's, it's genuine. It's my own hair. It's my own hair. The reveal will show that, in fact, the whole Instagram feed has been a self-portrait. It is a self-portrait. It's called Instagram, capital I, lowercase n-s-t-a-g-r, capital A-m. So it's I and Very Instagram. Very clever. And um, like I said, it's, it's all a self-portrait, which in fact, what, what everyone's Instagram project is. It's a self-portrait. Everyone's what Instagram everyone project is a self-portrait. What everyone so, makes um, is a self-portrait. That's the idea. So that, and that will be the end of this project. So, that's that. Next talk is about another body of work I make um, based on figures. And the figurative work um, is developed the same way that all the other images are, um, and it's kind of based on this idea of, of a really disciplined way of approaching making images. Um, it's different in that I'm drawing from life for the figures as opposed to just uh, from my imagination. Um, this whole body of work, it's a... Um, um, it, it strives to employ, again, this kind of same aesthetic that I've been using um, 
of these anonymously created universal sign systems. These are a few examples of the symbol set that was designed um, by a committee for the United States Department of Transportation in 74, 79. My professors actually were on that committee and helped design this, and this is actually how I learned to draw. My thought has always been that the, the development of this kind of aesthetic, um, again, kind of like end of uh, 20s into the early 30s, mostly East, Eastern European artists was um, co-opted by the state and by industry because it was so effective at efficiently communicating to a broad audience. So these are some examples of artists who were working at that time. Gerard Arntz is a huge influence um, on me. So utility was attached to this aesthetic pursuit um, as a new service industry began to be formalized, and that, of course, was graphic design. So my, my, my thought was that, always, that this aesthetic pursuit kind of spun off from official art history um, because it was so good at communicating that there could be a utility attached to it. Um, and then this, this is a more work kind of made uh, in that spirit of creating universal symbols, Lance Wyman's uh, Olympic sign symbols, Otto Eicher, 1972, developed a symbol set. And so to assume that the power of that aesthetic for myself and create, um, create images um, with that visual language has always been the idea, with all the work and then with the figures in particular. And this is an example of what that process looks like. And of course, again, since the drawings are vector files, they're equations, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no quantifying them and they can be um, reproduce or produced infinitely, and furthermore, taken apart and rearranged. This is an example of the, the drawing process, of course, and all the different uh, stages. And this is more direct translation from the figure to the more abstract uh, form. So when you look at the final figure, you may not realize that actually comes from something uh, a form like this. These are cyanotypes that I've made with this uh, series of works. Uh, paintings, paintings under black light. The sculptures are the, uh, where the, the, the figurative is, is now morphing into the abstract because I'm using and taking apart the figurative parts. Details of the paintings. A print on the left and another sculpture on the right. The next talk is called Cutting Losses. Every now and then I have to destroy work and cut my losses. In this example, this is a porcelain baked enamel uh, panels. Uh, that I received from the fabricator and they just weren't perfect and I had to destroy them and had them make them again and of course send the fabricator proof that I destroyed what they had sent me. Um, these are more porcelain baked enamel pieces um, that I had to take to the metal junkyard in Chelsea. Actually you can see this great Kenny Scharf piece in the up, upper right hand corner. Um, I had to, had to destroy these, I had to cut my losses. <laughs> I was making uh, acrylic sculptures in the studio that just weren't quite right. This was about the same time that I had the paint guns in the studio, so I just used them as target practice and shot them up. <laughs> this was a sculpture I made. It's called Kissing. It's two fiberglass discs that rotate in opposite directions. There's a central axis and a bar in the middle and a motor in the base, and the thing just kept breaking down, and it was just a real pain in the ass, and I decided I just had to cut my loss and just destroy the whole thing. I think it's really important not to let anything out in the world that just isn't perfect and doesn't work and doesn't adhere to uh, you know, your standards. So this was another case of cutting my losses and destroying that piece. 
I got uh, got it stuck in my head that I, I have that I wanted to make this barnacle sculpture. I have a good friend who's a um, marine biologist, and he gave me th this uh, set of barnacles. And so in my home, I had this little cluster of barnacles, and I have plants all over my home. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be great to make this barnacle uh, cluster sculpture planter type thing? So I went through the process of kind of mocking it up and, and working with a fabricator and taking photographs and getting something like this made out of fiberglass. I got it in the studio and it just didn't work. It didn't feel right and I had to destroy that. I had to cut my loss with that. <laughs> I was uh, doing the, this, this, this other project where I was working with a Japanese company called Vanimals and I was making what I called Ryanimals, these little figures that could be taken apart and each character had a different name and different tools and they could hold different tools, everything from like cleaning bottle to like a dildo and a mushroom and a dagger. And they were gonna have these little video games when, and they were gonna control their lives and be in control of their destiny through the games that they played. And there was this whole story and like I said, each one had a different character. The packaging I was working on and I was showing how, you know, you can rearrange all the different parts, showing them how to make them. We, um, and how all the different parts can be rearranged got to the prototyping phase and got to the model making phase and they were owned by an umbrella company, Sony, and I got the contract and the contract was awful and just aggressive and I just bailed. I was just like, I just got cut my losses. This is awful. This is uh, a, an aggressive contract and I couldn't get uh, retained the rights and there was a lot of other bullshit in the contract. I was just like, fuck it, forget it, out it. <laughs> so that's an example of cutting your losses. This was a painting that was damaged by art handlers. Actually, the, uh, the moving company, um, a forklift went through the crate and through the painting, which was on a wood panel, and it couldn't be repaired, and there was, there was no good way to kind of um, uh, repair it or even send it to a restore. So we had to uh, take the loss and destroy the painting even further in order to prove to the, for the insurance claim that we actually did destroy it. Another example of destroying something to you, so you cut your losses. These works were um, stolen from a show in, Mo from in Munich and then recovered and I had shipped to the, the gallery I worked with in Milan and went to the warehouse in Milan to recover this work realized, you know what, some of it's already damaged and it's, furthermore, it's not even worth shipping the rest back. Let's destroy it on site. And that's what we did. This is another example of a project that I, I eventually had to, had to shut down. I was developing shoes with uh, DC shoes. And the idea was that um, the, the soles were gonna be um, cut out of rubber and you could like dip them in paint and then make shoe print prints and each one would be a monoprint and it was gonna be this whole thing. And we got to the prototyping stage and it just wasn't right and it was like a four year long project and we both just agreed let's just cut our losses. Um, these are more of those porcelain baked enamel pieces. These things, they're beautiful and I love the material but they're so fragile so there's no repairing. If you just nick one, um, then you have to destroy the whole thing. So this is another example of destroying those at the metal scrap yard. Oh, okay, so I love making books, and um, I have a lot of ideas for books, and I start books. Okay, so that's the timer. I'm just going to zip through this. So many books, and I, I decided to take just four of them and then make a book about unpublished books, and eventually this book about unpublished books, this is just a mock-up of the cover. That Even that didn't get made. Um, <laughs> So one of the books was called Pictionary, Dictionary, and although the title could have been problematic legally, I thought there was gonna be an easy way to get through it. But the idea was I love playing Pictionary in the studio and at home and we have game nights and have all of our friends over and we play Pictionary. I love saving all the drawings at the end and I think that you could find some kind of thread between everyone's drawings and develop a universal symbol based on what those threads are to find you know, the symbol solution for whatever the word is. Um, that you're trying to communicate. So obviously around the clock, everyone tends to draw the same thing. For a beard, everyone kind of tends to draw the same thing. Same is true with candlelight and cat. Cat's basically ears and whiskers and a circle. So I was gonna put this whole book together called Pictionary Dictionary and, and uh, even worked with a design firm to, to do mock-up layouts. And, uh, and at the end, I just thought it's just not it's just too light of an idea. It's just like, it, there's just not enough to it. So I, I just, I didn't do it. I, I cut my losses. I abandoned that. That's true of this 
book project too that I never finished. It's called Identity Standards Manual. I actually finished the book. I just never cared to publish it because I just I don't think there's enough to it. Um, but certainly enough to share with you in the lecture, I guess. <laughs> but, but the idea the idea was to draw these parallels between taggers and corporations and what each do with their mark and how each strive to um, maintain a standard um, in, in their mark making. And in order to, to demonstrate that, I took graffiti tags, went through a sketch process to turn them into kind of corporate logos and turn them into these fictitious companies. And then it, I went in reverse. I took corporate logos and turned them into graffiti tags. And this is what some of those pages look like. So Zato, I turned into a, um, a band and so you see a band flyer and a band patch. Bass beer gets turned into a little graffiti tag like that. SB, we turned into a, uh, a basketball team. The Savannah boss. NBC um, got scribbled as a tag. This tag got turned into a logo for a, an electric company. FedEx got turned into this. This tag got turned into a pharmaceutical company. <laughs> and uh, Motorola logo got turned into a tag and then put back up in the street. So um, none of that ever got made. And again, it was all about just kind of cutting your losses. I, I just didn't think there was enough there to follow through and actually make it a book. This next talk is called Art History is Not Linear. And it is another body of work that I make um, that is based on art historical works and, and my redrawing or interpretation of those works. So I'd been doing this for a while before um, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts came to me and wanted to do a commission. And I thought, well, why don't I take this idea and apply it to the museum? And what I did was look at the permanent collection at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and I selected 200 objects um, from their collection and made drawings based on those 200 objects. I then took those 200 drawings and use them as the ingredients for a series of paintings that the museum acquired and they actually hang in their, in their foyer. Um, and so this is what some of that process looks like. In some cases, it's a direct translation like this. In other cases, I'm taking elements of the work. So here you see a picture within a picture and it turns into a drawing like that on the right. So they're not necessarily symbols of the artwork, but they are symbolic drawings that are inspired by the artwork. Don't worry, I'm not showing you all 200, but just a few more examples. And in a case like this, I was just interested in the, the crown of thorns and the head and the hand um, in the lower right hand corner of that painting. I was really drawn to that and then recombined them. And then again, what I did was take those 200 drawings, collage them together through um, silkscreen painting process. And this is what some of that process looks like. And this is an example of how a painting gets built with the layers and layers of images. This is the final painting. And then you could go back and kind of reverse engineer the painting and take the parts uh, and see where all the little elements came from. 
Um, and actually, in, in the museum, they have a, 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 a like a decoder chart that shows you the individual elements, which aren't necessarily so legible in the final painting. And I went through that same process here at Cranbrook. This, um, that show is, is, is uh, the back gallery behind the main gallery where I chose 10 objects from the museum's collection and made a series of sketches and a final drawing for one for each of those uh, objects in their collection. And this is what it looked like in the uh, exhibition at uh, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And these are some of the final paintings. The end. <laughs>